Hey, everybody. Uh, my name is Michael McCune. I'm a software engineer at Red Hat, and uh, I'm going to talk with you today about how to build collaboration and influence open source projects. So we'll talk a little bit about what I think collaboration and influence are, and then I'll share some recommendations I have for how you could uh, improve those things for yourself and for the communities that you're in. But before we do that, I want to give a few warnings. So the first warning is that I'm going to talk about topics today that might lead you to have some self-reflection. It might lead you to look at things in a different way that you might not be expecting. Um, I'm also going to use words and language that talk more about the, the social and sometimes called soft aspects of the work that we do um, so that you can become you know, more influential through those skills. But like this image, um, I'm just going to be like talking and showing you some pictures. The real core of this message is the doing, the going out there and like practicing these things. So the next question you might ask yourself is like, you know, who's this guy? What's he doing? This talk is all in my experience. I don't have uh, like studies or academic credentials to back up what I'm saying here. Um, I'm just going to give you kind of anecdotal data from my own personal experiences which follows into the next question, like why would you listen to me? You know, what, what, is, what has this guy done, right? So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about my history to set this up. Um, I've been developing software for a while, back into the 20th century, and when I left uh, college, you know, I guess this thing's just gonna go on without me. When I left college, I started off doing PlayStation and Sega Saturn development uh, for a company that wasn't too far from here. And at the time, I was a Linux enthusiast and user, and this was in the very early days when you know, the Minix mailing list had just gotten their first announcements, but I was not yet really an open source user. Interestingly enough, the tooling for the PlayStation and the Sega Saturn used uh, GCC as the compiler, and we ended up using the Sigwin tooling to kind of control all that from our Windows boxes. So that was you know, kind of where things started for me. And after a few years of that, I felt, you know, the gaming industry is not that great in terms of, like, pay and everything, and I was getting a little tired of the running around. So I moved back to Detroit, which is where I'm from, and in Detroit, the auto companies are really huge, and I was able to quickly get jobs with uh, Chrysler and Ford, and I spent a number of years helping them to build uh, engine testing facilities. Uh, it's more kind of embedded, low-level work, but still, there wasn't really any open source at this point. And even though I was getting into using real-time Unixes and whatnot, we still weren't really in the open source world. And so my next big experience after that was I went to work for a global positioning company called Magellan. And while I was there, I became the operating system guy. And initially, we were using a public domain operating system, if any of you know, called MicroCOS. And at the time, the source code for that operating system, you could get in a book, basically. So I was working with that and developing that, and then I left the company for a year. And in that one year span of time that I was gone, they decided to design a new product based on Windows CE, and it was not going well for them. So I came back after a, a short sabbatical, and I helped them to build a Linux file system and uh, you know, kernel for the hardware that they had created. And so we started to transfer everything to an open source build system that we created. Um, and I spent a lot of time hacking on this, uh, essentially an alternative to BuildRoot or Yocto, if you remember the, those early days of kind of cross-compiling tool chains. And I spent a lot of time doing this, and we you know, built an entire open source ecosystem for this product. And the product um, was the Hertz Never Lost. If you, if you ever drove around in the early 2000s, you might have seen these in Hertz cars. Um, and that... And that was where you know, my life started to change a little bit in terms of the open source involvement because through the work I was doing, I was getting a chance to work in the upstream. I was starting to experience that. And I went back to my boss at the time and I said, hey, like, you know, we built this huge uh, cross-compiling tool chain and it's really easy to use and like, it it's kind of has many of the features that these other ones that are emerging has. And I said, let's, let's make this open source. Let's, let's give this back to the community. And... My boss at the time, I still remember what he said. He was kind of like, Mike, we don't really do that here. And I, you know, I was disappointed because I was like, look, we've taken all this open source stuff. Like, we should be giving back. And the writing was kind of on the wall at that point. And so luckily, um, after, after that, 
I was able to join Red Hat, um, where I initially worked on OpenStack, and now I work on Kubernetes. Um, and I've been at Red Hat for about 10 years now. And in my OpenStack days, uh, I ended up spending a lot of time in the security uh, working group that they had and the API working group that they had. And I ended up chairing uh, both those organizations. And I spent a lot of time doing work in the community there. And likewise, now I work in the Kubernetes community. Uh, I'm a chair and a tech lead for one of the SIGs there. I also participate frequently in the upstream, and I, I contribute a lot of my code to the upstream. So this is my experience and where this talk is coming from and, and what I want to share with you today. So let's talk about what does collaboration look like, or what do I think collaboration looks like? So collaboration might look like this. It might be a ragtag group of nonconformists who are driven by a desire to complete their mission, maybe help their friends and society out. But it might also look like this, which is, you know, a highly coordinated group, all part of the same organization, you know, working to achieve a goal that might fit into a larger piece with other groups to coordinate with. Or it might look like this which is the Kubernetes uh, developers and contributors from, I think, a few years ago. This might have been 2021 or 2020. Um, and this is a pretty diverse group working on all sorts of different projects, but they come together to make the largest open source project we've ever seen in, you know, in history so far. So these are kind of examples of what a collaboration might look like, but what are the qualities of a healthy collaboration that goes beyond just the looks. So these are some of the things that I think are the most important about when you evaluate a collaboration or a collaborative community, what to look for for the health. So the first one for me is everyone is welcome. And you know, I like to use the, the English phrase table stakes here. You know, so like, I, I'm not much of a better, but in gambling, you know, there's this notion of table stakes. Like this is what you have to pay to sit down at the table and play. And for me, if you have a community where everyone is not welcome or there are people who, are, who have become unwelcomed, you know, that's not good. So everyone should be welcome to come to those spaces and collaborate. And you know, I think it's tough to speak in absolutes about this because sometimes there are people you need to exclude from communities, right? Perhaps they've behaved poorly or they've shown themselves to be someone who, who does not want to cooperate. That's where things can get a little bit more difficult. And, I, and I'm not gonna get too deep into that side because you could have a whole nother talk on how to deal with conflict and how, and how to set up codes of conduct and whatnot. But there is an experience that I kind of liken this to when I look at a community. So where I come from, uh, drum circles are kind of like a cool thing to do during the summertime. And I don't know, is anybody here familiar with drum circles? Like anybody been, maybe been to a festival? Okay, so if a few people. Like the, the notion is everyone kind of brings a drum and you're at the park having a barbecue or something. And, you know, people just kind of circle up and they all start playing and having a good time. But the metaphor here for me is that this is uh, an, implicit ex an, an implicit expression of the collaboration that's going on, right? Because you can hear what's happening. It seems pretty apparent what is going on, what direction is happening. You might be sitting next to people who have more skill than you. You might be sitting next to people who have less skill than you. Some people might have different equipment. but everyone is welcome to come and, and kind of join in. Now, granted, if you start making you know, crazy noise, you might get some strange looks, but the notion is you're welcome everyone to come to that community. So everyone is welcome for me is a must. Another thing that makes for a really good collaboration or a healthy collaboration is having a common goal. So sometimes people just get together and they talk about a lofty idea and then it's like, okay, it never gets written down, we never codify it, we never think about like, you know, what are we doing? So how do people know what to do? How do they know who to talk to? Um, how do they know, where, you know what's gonna happen a month from now, a year from now? So for me, you've gotta have some sort of goal that you can write down and let everyone know, like these are the artifacts you should look at. This is what we're trying to do. You know, it might start off small, but it, over time you build a roadmap, you build a feature list, People get a clear impression of what this project is doing, and it can be a really powerful way to keep the collaboration in line, because if everyone agrees to those goals, or if you have a consensus agreement, 
it's always easy to turn back to them and say like, well, you know, like, I, do we need to take the ring all the way to Mount Doom? Like, you know, y yes, we do. Like, we, we agreed this is what we're doing. So it helps keep everyone on track and it helps make the collaboration stronger because even people who aren't there can see where you're going. So another thing that's really important for me is, is learning encouraged in the collaboration. Does the atmosphere of the project promote people to come learn? Because especially with open source technology, Oftentimes, these things are very complicated. They have a lot of layers to them. And so if you have an environment where people don't feel comfortable to ask questions or, or feel like they're, uh, you know, if I ask too basic a question, people are going to look at me like, oh, this guy, who's this guy? He's like, he doesn't know what the hell's going on. So I think, like, it's really important to make those spaces. And one, one of the images that kind of comes to my mind is this great picture of, Albert Einstein at Lincoln University uh, in 1946. And this was at a time when, you know, you know the United States was not, uh, it was much more segregated place than it is today. And Lincoln University is a historically black university. And Einstein made a point to go to this place and to create a space for learning and to, to reach out directly to those communities that needed it. And I think, you know, I don't know what, I don't know what Einstein was thinking, but I, I, have an, I have a feeling that he understood the need for creating these welcoming environments where people can learn. And so I try to think about this when I go into spaces. How can I be more charitable? How can I encourage learning there? So these are just a, a few points that are like the high points for me in terms of what a healthy collaboration looks like. But what can we do to help collaborate or to help build that collaboration, to help cultivate the health of that collaboration. So the first thing for me is uh, be kind. It may seem simple, and sometimes it can be very difficult in practice, but I'm sure, you know, if many of you are like me, you maybe had a parent or a, a family member or a mentor who advised you to be kind and compassionate to others. You know, we're, we're taught to, to, be, to be loving towards those around us, and for me, this is kind of a core part of being a decent human, but when you're building a collaboration, this can be super powerful. And there's a quote that kind of sticks in my mind um, that I think about, and that is, you know, be kind for everyone you meet is fighting a hard battle. Now, I did some research to try and figure out where this quote came from because it's attributed to Plato, it's attributed to Philo of Alexandria, it's attributed to John Watson in the, in the recent era and Ian McLaren, so like, it's not entirely clear where this quote comes from, but I think the point is that it resonates with everyone. Everyone is fighting their own battle, and we need to recognize the hard battles that our colleagues and our friends and our collaborators are going through. And when you start to have that implicit empathy, you start to become, it becomes easier to find the kindness. And I think, you know, a story that kind of pops into my head from, from the recent days is uh, yeah, everyone here remembers the XZ supply chain kind of thing that went on earlier this year? When you examine the details of that, it's, it's like a human story, right? There was one person who was maintaining this library, and, you know, through no fault of their own, because they're dealing with, you know, they're fighting their own hard battle, they found another collaborator who wanted to help them out. And it turns out this person did not have good intentions. But the notion is that. We, if we can recognize those hard battles, hopefully we can help build the kindness that makes these collaborations better. So I, I, don't, I don't think there's anything here that like says this could have helped the XZ situation, but it's acknowledging the human story behind these things. So another thing you can do is state the goals. Does the collaboration you're working on have a roadmap? Does it have an easy place to find out where to go to collaborate? Does it have you know, a mailing list, those kind of things. How should we organize this project? So, you know, is there a way that you can help add these things? When you come to a, a collaboration, especially an open source collaboration, this is a great way to get involved. And even though I'm talking about the health of the collaboration here, this is also an opportunity for you to start thinking about influence and how you become a member of the community. Because are these simple things like an agenda or a roadmap, are they there? And if not, why aren't they there? And maybe you'll be the one to write that thing and you'll help make the collaboration better. You'll be adding to that. So another thing, be inclusive, right? Reach out to people who might be having trouble. 
reach out, look for those people who are a little afraid to, you know, to ask a question and help them to become comfortable with that. Help them to find the space to do the things that we were talking about earlier in terms of learning, right? Because again, coming to Kubernetes or coming to OpenStack, these are hugely complicated projects. And in order to learn it, you're gonna have to expose yourself. You're gonna have to become vulnerable. And so if you can create an inclusive environment, you can help foster people's learning that way and foster their comfort in the collaboration. And so the quote that I kind of think about is assume positive intentions, right? Now, if, in, if, you, if any of you are like me, I hear this through the corporate kind of speak all the time, right? And then, you know, assume positive intention. Assume it comes up all the time. And I don't think that this phrase is meant to say turn off your internal sensors for people behaving poorly. It doesn't mean that everyone is always going to have positive intentions. But it means can you change your perspective so that I can assume that what you're saying is not necessarily meant as an attack on me. And, and where this comes into most focus for me is uh, on pull requests for changes to projects. I might be speaking with someone through the pull request and they're giving me feedback about my changes and I might, want, I might be having a bad day or I might just not read the sentence right or maybe I dropped a word and all of a sudden I think they're attacking me, they're trying to make me think that you know I'm stupid or something. And when really the truth might be that this person I'm talking to English could be their second or third or fourth language. And so maybe they're just trying to get a message across and say, hey, I, th I think you should do things this way rather than that way. But if you can change your mindset to read those with positive intentions, this person wants to help me make the software better. Can I assume the positive intention behind it? And so that, that's what I use as a communication tool to help make good choices in what I do. And so if we do these simple things, uh, everything's going to be like utopia, right? It's, you know, it's magic, candy, unicorns, like we're, we're all going to be happy. Okay, not, not exactly, right? I mean, these are some guides to help with improving the health, things to look for to make the collaborations that you're involved with better. But, and like I said before, conflict does arise. And the, the deepest I'll go into this is when you get into a situation where you feel like the collaboration you're in is becoming unhealthy, and that might be based around you know, the people who are involved in it, those are the times when you have to look for your peers and you have to look for things like codes of conduct to help you heal those communities. And there's great talks out there about this. Like I said, you could do a whole talk just on conflict resolution. I'm not going to go much deeper into it than that. But just know that it, it is going to take work and it's not just going to magically happen. You're going to have to be there for it. So. I'm gonna turn the corner a little bit now and talk about how can we build influence? And what does influence look like in an open source community? Well, at the very basic level, it might look like this. This is a, a pull request that I was involved with along with a, a bunch of other great people. And you can see maybe here at the bottom, we created this in uh, March and it didn't get you know, landed or updated until six months later. And this is work that I became involved with when I joined the current team I'm on, but the engineering work had been going on before that. And so sometimes when you come into uh, open source projects, you might end up with these really long tail things and being there for it oftentimes can be very powerful in terms of your influence because you're helping to complete something. You're helping to see it all the way through. So I think about things like this a lot because I, I tend to get involved in very long running changes that happen in the upstream, and that can be very draining for people. Oftentimes we wanna show up, make a couple PRs, and all of a sudden like, you know, I'm a maintainer. But it might not be that way. So another thing that influence might look like is this. And this is a screenshot I took from one of the upstream Kubernetes meetings. This is uh, the cluster API meeting. Uh, you might be able to become a speaker in a meeting. You might be able to host a meeting. These are often places you can find to become more involved in the project. Now, this, this can be difficult if, if uh, you know, maybe you're a little anxious about your speaking skills or whatever, but what I look for is opportunities where the maintainers of projects say, hey, would anyone like to host this meeting? Would anyone like to become more involved? And when people say that, that's a cue for you to say, well, you know what? I've never done it before, but I would like to become more involved. Could you help me? What, what, what does it take to do this? And so this is another thing to look at in terms of how you can build your influence. And I think where this can end up is 
you might, your influence might take you to this, where you could become a speaker at, this was from KubeCon um, last year, and I was able to present a talk with uh, my colleagues Joel and Bridget, and when you're involved, especially in upstream communities like Kubernetes, and Kubernetes is a very large community, you'll hear these calls to say, hey, we, we're looking for a maintainer track talk for the next KubeCon. Does anyone want to get involved? Does anyone have an idea? Again, these are clues for you to say, you know what, I would like to be involved. I've never done this before, but I would like to be involved. And if you're in a healthy collaboration, there will be people there to help you learn, to help you build your skills. So look for these opportunities. But these are just kind of some ways that influence is expressed. What, what is influence, or what do I think influence is? And certainly it's not just you know, hosting meetings and you know, making pull requests, right? For me, influence is about relationships. It's about having good relationships with the community and the maintainers. And it can be really difficult for more developer or engineering types who are, who are oftentimes, you know, we're just concerned about the code or the efficiency or the benchmarks. You know, and, and we don't want to think about these soft sides of like, how do I build a relationship? How do I build trust with people around me? It's not just landing a lot of pull requests. There are other methods to that as well. So one of the things that I like to think about in terms of what does influence look like is do you feel comfortable to propose changes and criticize processes, right? So as your influence starts to grow, ideally this would happen in a, in a kind of formalized way, but being able to convey honest thoughts in an impromptu moment can really, uh, you know, without insulting or kind of injuring other people, can really be a way to understand how your influence is growing. And so this is a, a kind of a marker to look for. Another one is, do you have the support from the community and the maintainers? And this doesn't mean that they agree with everything you say or they, or they just want to merge all your pull requests, but do you feel that you have their support even when you bring an idea that doesn't make sense? Or even when you bring an idea that maybe goes against the grain or is, or is dissenting with the majority opinion? And as your influence grows, you'll start to recognize these situations where you know, people will extend much more leeway to you. And that's a good way to gauge that your influence is growing in those situations. So what are some things that you can actually do to grow your influence. And I, I wanna keep in mind here that, you know, it takes two to tango, right? Like you can't just say, I'm gonna grow my influence and like I don't care what, this, what the community says, right? Like that, uh, unless you're extremely lucky or talented, that's probably not gonna happen. So you have to keep in mind that it's, it's gonna take a consistent application of, of kind of these things, but also that you're gonna have to be working with people. And this goes back to building relationships and, and building, you know, those collaborations. So one of the things you can do, and this is probably my favorite, is fight for the users. Become a user of the projects that you're getting involved in. Learn what the users want and champion their ideas. And this will become one of the most powerful ways for you to grow influence in a project because oftentimes the users, they just want to use the software. Maybe they want to see more features come in. Maybe they want to see you know, less bugs. And if you can understand what they truly want, you can help to grow your influence by bringing those things to the project and making the project aware of how to make things better. And so, you know, the image I love for this is from a movie that I grew up with, Tron, you know, he, he fights for the users. What I try to do, and I'm going to use myself as an example here, and, and I think in some ways I'm a terrible example of this because if we think about the origins of open source and how we got to where we are, in the beginning, um, you know, people were writing software because they needed to use it. You know, like if we needed a domain name server, you know, we wanted to not remember IP addresses all the time. So we needed to collaborate and do those kind of things. I work on cloud providers, right? Like a, a piece of the Kubernetes infrastructure that isn't exposed to anyone except the admins. And it's, how would you become a user of that? I'm not gonna go home and just spin up an AWS account and say, you know what, I'm gonna, I'm gonna play with the AWS cloud provider just to like, just to see how it works. So in my case, my employer is paying me to work in these communities, but it doesn't mean that I just write unit tests and write end-to-end -end tests and then I forget about it. No, 
I try to operate these pieces of software. I try to learn from people in the community, what are the problems that you're having using these things? And then I try to see, can I hit those problems as well? Because if I can start to learn what the users are doing, I can start to make it better. And I can start to take their ideas and bring them back into the open source communities. So really, be like Tron, fight for the users. Another one, and probably hear this a lot, and I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm probably gonna say chop water, carry wood at least once, so I'm just letting you know, but chop wood, carry water. We hear this all the time. It gets spoken about a lot in open source communities. But what does it really mean? No one ever really talks about where did this come from? What, you know, what does it mean? And um, again, I looked into kind of the history of this, and I think the most solid history goes back to uh, Zen Buddhism, and it's a, a story about a kind of an older student and a younger student. And the, and the older student, you know, for lack of a better word, is you know, kind of a, a monk, and the younger student is still an acolyte. And the younger student is kind of complaining about doing the daily chores. And the older student, you know, is telling him, like, you know, chop wood, carry water. And he's like, yeah, but when I'm enlightened, I'm not going to have to do any of this stuff, right? I, everything's going to be gravy at that point. And he's like, before enlightenment, chop wood, carry water. After enlightenment, chop wood, carry water. And what this means is to become invested in the day-to-day -day activities of life. And for our projects, what that means is, you know, become involved in the, in the continuous integration, become involved in the testing, become involved in the documentation. But because even if you become a maintainer, it's not like you're not gonna have to do that work anymore. You're still gonna have to do that work. And you're gonna be one of the experts at doing that work. So learn to be invested in that stuff. And I think a funny example of this, just to show how this permeates, is uh, this is a, a picture of one of the awards that was given out in uh, 2023 at KubeCon for their uh, contributor awards. And they even put it on the front of this thing, chop pizza, carry boxes. They're still echoing this phraseology. Because if you look at the maintainers, even the ones who have been there for many, many years, you'll see their names are all over testing, and documentation and build infrastructure, not the, not you know the uh, the for lack of a better word, sexy parts of the project that are all the new things everyone wants to talk about. It's these parts that keep it running, that keep the things moving. Become invested in that. So, another thing, and this one is going to be very subtle. Lead when called, and this is really difficult. Becoming a leader, learning leadership qualities is not an easy thing to do because you can't just be told how to do it. You have to actually go out there and do it. And what I mean by lead when called is look for those opportunities that arise to say, you know, someone in the project might be like, hey, we need someone to help us build a new website for documentation. And maybe I know a little bit about websites. I'll get involved in that. You can become, you know, the leader of a small area and lean into that role and practice your skills in that way with the community. And so there's a, you know, I'm kind of a, I'm kind of a sci-fi nerd and there's a scene, this is a Star Trek D Space Nine. I, you know, I don't, I don't know if any of you know this or not, but like this is the very end of the show. And sp sorry, spoilers, but you know, you've had 20 some odd years to catch up. So um, <laughs> the character on the, on the far right there who's got this cloak, um, his name is Worf, and he's one of the main characters, and he has just killed the previous emperor of his people's uh, empire. And by their laws of combat, he is now the leader. And so they put the cloak on him, and he's like, wait a minute. Like, before I get too wrapped up in the, in the, the heady, you know, enthusiasm of being the leader of an entire people, I'm not the right person for this. And he turns to this other guy in the middle, Martok, and he says, this guy is the right guy for this. And so to me, this is one of those moments where you say, someone might turn to you one day and be like, hey, you know, I see that you know a little bit about websites. Would you mind helping us set up the documentation site for our, you know, for our project? And you might think about it, and you, you, know, you may, may or may not want to, but that's one, of those, that's one of those calls. That's when someone's putting the cloak on your shoulders. And if you run with that, you can start to build your influence. So we're starting to run short on time, but we're almost there. So this is the Grand Canyon, beautiful place. It's been around for, you know, a while, but the, the, this like river that is, is relatively recent, you know, five to six million years. And, but it didn't happen overnight. 
And the reason I'm putting this image up is because I think in many ways our, our efforts in open source communities have to be like this river cutting through the Grand Canyon. It's not going to happen overnight. It's going to take you time and consistent application of these techniques and a consistent presence. And if you can do that successfully, you'll create that river and you'll become like that. And so I want to come back to a point that I made earlier, which was there was a time when I saw the writing on the wall for me. And this, I'm using this uh, Banksy image because I just thought it was funny, but it also kind of drives home a point, which is working in open source communities today looks very different than it did you know, maybe when I was younger or some of you were younger. The, the enterprise movement in open source has become huge. And so there's a lot of money now to be involved in open source communities. And you, you may not, um, you may be working on a project that's just your passion project. And, and so the motivation for that is clear. But if you're not, and you're in a corporate situation, it's good to understand the why of becoming more influential in open source communities. And it's because if you become influential in those communities, you can help to drive the things that your users want into the software that's in the open source. And building influence and, and collaborations is vital to driving that work forward. And any organization that cares about what their customers want or what their users want are going to want to have a stake at the table so that they can see their changes put into upstream. Because I can tell you from experience, you don't want to have to maintain your own fork with all your own custom code when you could push it to the upstream if you can. And so these are things to think about if you're in a situation where maybe uh, you know, your bosses are wondering, why do you want to go to KubeCon? You know, well, I want to go so that I can learn from these other community members, so that I can become more engaged in what's happening there. So I'm going to wrap up with just a quick review here of you know, some of what we talked about today. So when we're talking about collaborations, these are the things that I try to think about at the top of my mind. Be kind, you know, create an environment that is welcoming and friendly for people. Make sure that you state the goals. Make sure that everyone kind of knows what's happening and where they can go. And be inclusive. Make sure that you're building a space where people can come and learn and they can be part of what you're doing. When you talk about influence and you're thinking about how you build your influence, fight for the users. Learn what the users want. Use the software that you're working on, even if it seems abstract and bizarre. Understand what their problems are. Chop wood and carry water. Become invested in the day-to-day -day activities, the lifeblood of the project. Is testing working OK? Do the build scripts still work? If I run the getting started manual, does it work? These are opportunities. And then lead when called. Look for those chances. You might be in a meeting and someone says, hey, do you want to be part of the talk we're giving at KubeCon? If you're interested in growing your influence and you think you can make it happen, say yes. Go along with it. It will be difficult, but it will get easier over time, and your influence will grow from that. So I'm going to leave you know, kind of with a funny slide here. Uh, we, you know, we talked about some serious topics out there, but I you know, personally have a passion uh, for open source software, and I think it can be really fun and it doesn't have to all just be business and dollars and cents. Make friends out there, build inclusive spaces, be kind to people, and you will notice yourself start to rise. And you'll notice your, your influence will grow and people will come and they'll want to talk to you and they'll want to ask about the projects that are happening. So it's dangerous to go alone out there, but hopefully you can take some of this advice with you. And if you want to stay in touch, I've got a blog that I haven't updated in a long time. Uh, sorry, but hopefully I have a new one out next week. And, uh, you know, look me up on uh, the Fediverse. So with that, thank you very much.